Hi, listeners. Before we dive into today's episode, I wanted to let you know that this episode is sponsored by The Draw Shop, and we've got something exciting for you. Let me ask you something. Have you ever been asked what you do? We all get asked this, right? Have you then answered and then got the response of totally glazed over eyes or just the look of someone politely smiling but definitely not caring? It sucks. I know. I've totally been there on both sides, actually. That's why my team and I at The Draw Shop now offer a service to help you perfect your elevator pitch so that people immediately understand how you can make their life better and so that you can use this anywhere in your marketing. It's the single statement that compels your prospects to take action right away. Here's what happens. You meet with an expert copywriter on our team to define the problem you solve, how you solve it, and the transformation your customers experience after working with you. From there, we'll turn that into a short and sweet elevator pitch just for you and create a compelling one-page visual story to help the world better understand your business and how you can help them. For a special limited time offer, we are offering you this service for one-third the usual price, valued at $1,500. Yep, 70% off. Again, this will only be available for a limited time, and we've already seen incredible results with our clients changing this one single statement. So to get your word perfect pitch today, head to www.thedrawshop.com forward slash elevator pitch now. That's www.thedrawshop.com forward slash elevator pitch. Okay, let's get into today's episode. If people are in, they're in. And I think that crowdfunding is actually a very beautiful thing because it kind of allows people this rare opportunity to read about a company and a person and a team and make a decision that normally only investors or bankers get to make when it comes to, should this company exist, do I want to fund them? And I think it's a really lovely thing that that people can come together and bring companies to life. For many of you, you have a really great idea. You have a product that you want to put out and you've thought about crowdfunding and you're just not sure exactly how to go about it. And you wonder if it's going to be a success. Well, today's guest, Colin McIntosh, did that just himself. He is the founder and CEO of Sheets and Giggles. Yes, you heard me right, Sheets and Giggles. It's a Denver-based, fast-growing brand, like super fast, in the $12 billion U.S. betting space. I said Sheets, yes. Launched on Indiegogo in 2018 with a $284,000 crowdfunding campaign. He's raised money since. We talk all about venture capital. We talk about investors. And things, his his perspective on it, which I so appreciate. And I think you guys are really, really going to want to pay attention to, especially if you are someone who is looking to raise money for your business or for an idea. He's about 30 years old right now, and he's got a really cool story of how he came into this. And after some, oh, I think it was four times being fired and <laughs> realizing he was not an employee, he he started this business. And I'm going to let him tell the whole story, but we're talking about entrepreneurship. We're talking about venture capital. We're definitely talking a lot about crowdfunding and the why behind the things he does. So enjoy this interview. Hey, Colin. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here, Summer. Well, you've got a really great story that it's it's just really great that I'm going to have you share in just a minute. You also have so, so many pieces of genius to to share <laughs> with your journey that I think are going to be really inspiring for our audience. So oh, geez. Um, don't, 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 oversell, <laughs> don't oversell me. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm impressed. I, I'm I'm impressed from just the little bit that I know. So what's really cool is that I'm gonna I know I'm gonna learn even more with the audience. So this is gonna be great. So with that, can you give us the give us kind of the high level and then we'll we'll get into like the the bits and pieces, but give us the high level of how you started Sheets and Giggles and like <laughs> the story behind it and a little bit about yourself along the way. 
Sure. I hope there were a few people listening that just heard like sheets and giggles and be like, wait, what did I hear? that?" Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, so I'm, you know, I'm Colin, I'm the founder and CEO of sheets and giggles. I always tell people, if you haven't heard of us, spoiler alert, we sell bed sheets. Uh, and that's, <laughs> that's my, kind of my, my elevator pitch, but basically we sell bedding sheets. We also do blankets, comforters. Uh, we're branching out into other home textiles as well. And we make those out of a material called Lyocell which is made from eucalyptus trees. And so people call our sheets eucalyptus sheets, just like they call, you know, viscose bamboo sheets. And it's considered, our Lyle cell is considered uh, the most sustainable fabric in the world. By many, it uses up to 96% less water than cotton sheets, a lot less energy, no insecticides, no pesticides. And, you know, cotton by itself uses something like, you know, 16 to 24% of the world's insecticides as a crop. And so it's sustainable, but you know, also obviously with the brand voice, the sheets and giggles, it's a very funny brand. And we do, we have a lot of fun with our audience and we, and we don't take ourselves too seriously, you know, even though we do have a sustainability mission and we do like to be a positive force for good in the world, we also make sure that, you know, we're never taking ourselves too seriously. And so it's been a really nice, you know, few years since I started the company about three years ago. And we launched on Indiegogo with a crowdfunding campaign in May of 2018, so just over two years ago, ended up being the largest crowdfund ever for the betting category on Indiegogo with $284,000 crowdfunded. Then after that, we were just kind of off to the races, and you know now we're at a point where I, you know, I never really imagined that we'd be in such a short period of time, and I can thank my team for that. They've been wonderful, especially through the last few months. And we're based in Denver, but we do have a remote team with folks in Florida and California as well. So. Yeah, that's kind of the high level overview and happy to dive into any detail about starting it or why or, you know, the reasons behind it or, you know, what we've done since. Well, yeah, I kind of want to go through all of those things. So, you know, the first thing is why, why starting it? And then what made you decide the path of how you would launch it? You know, crowdfunding. I want to get into crowdfunding because there's so many people that, you know, have an idea, something they really care about but they don't really know how to go about having something as successful as you have when it comes to crowdfunding. So let's start with the why and then go into, go into that. For sure. So I, I actually, I love crowdfunding. I love talking about it and I'm actually writing a a long blog post about it for people to, to learn from as well. Basically in terms of why I get that question all the time. Why, why bed sheets? Like why bedding? Such a weird thing for like a, you know, I was 27 at the time. I just, I just turned 30 still feeling pretty young, but now old, all of a sudden it's weird. Well, for stop. Like a- <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. You know, I'm on the other, other side of wise is what I, what I tell people, but you know, I, I being this late twenties, you know, guy, it was a weird, you know, people were like, why are you starting a bed sheets company? And like, you know, I could, I couldn't even fold a fitted sheet, which, you know, I, I still, it's very I, still challenging. I still, I still, I still, I still struggle with. So yeah. So basically the, the long story short is that I got laid off from my last startup in September, 2017. And it was very emotional, very painful. I, it was a wearable tech company that I had found here, you know, out of the founding team of with some friends of mine, we raised millions of dollars. We had, you know, 20 or 30 people working in downtown Denver. We were in, you know, nationwide retail at Brookstone and Target. And we had deals with HSN and QVC and it was, it was going pretty well. And then unfortunately it abruptly ended and I I can't really get into too much detail there, but you know, we all got laid off at 1 PM on a Monday. And that was really frustrating. It was really sad. I, I had poured myself into that for a few years since my, you know, my mid twenties, and I had written the original business plan when I was a twenty-three year old kid. So, you know, it was kind of sad for me to see that come to a close so so unceremoniously. And you know, first thing you do when you get laid off at one p.m. on a Monday with your friends is you go get, go get wasted. So we went to a Mexican place and we got tanked. And uh, we had a good time. We went to the Rockies game that night. Uh, the Marlins were in town from South Florida. So it was very serendipitous that my favorite baseball team was also in town that day. And I just kept telling my buddies, like they kept saying, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do next? I kept saying, I got this idea for this bed sheets company. And they had the same exact response. What the so you'd been thinking about it even before? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I've, been think- I've been thinking about it since maybe three or four months prior. And okay. I, I own the domains and I own the, I own the social handles. And I kept telling them, I said, no, 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 no. Listen, hear me out. It's a, and this is the, exactly why I did it. It's a massive commodities market with zero brand differentiation or loyalty and a highly fragmented space with no market leader that I have to chip away at 
that's highly traditionally physical retail that I can help bring online with a direct-to-consumer model. The supply chain is not extremely complex. It's still very difficult. And trust me, I've learned, I've taken some lumps there and I've learned, I've learned a lot about, you know, Know, the textile supply chain and, and, you know, but it doesn't have any Bluetooth or firmware or software engineers on staff, which is very much in contrast to the product that we had just been working on for the last three years. There were, and there were no good sustainable options in the market. I went on these rants about cotton and about polyester and, you know, oil-based synthetics like poly. And, you know, we, I just kept telling them about the business model. I was so enamored with it. I finally, three weeks later, I just decided to pull the trigger and incorporate. And so in October, 2017, I incorporated Sheets and Giggles. And that's kind of how it went down. So really, honest to God, it was initial idea for a betting company. I got the idea in June 2017 or so when I was watching War Dogs with Miles Teller. That's a true story. The, his character is like selling bed sheets out of the back of a pickup. And I got, so, I got so frustrated with his character not doing any market research before he, he bought all the bed sheets that I wrote a business plan for a bed sheets company that night. Um, wow. <laughs> I'm a little neurotic. Three or four months later, I started the company because the business model was just so compelling in terms of the blank canvas that I had in like a very large, very boring space. And so I would say that the brand was a really big part of what attracted me to it, the creativity and the fun that I could have with it. And then the sustainability aspect of the eucalyptus lyle cell was also very compelling. And so I, you know, just kind of set out to, I said, my goal is to make $3,000 a month so I can you know, pay my bills and, and be, be free and, you know, caught a bit of a tiger by the tail. That is so awesome. So going into now, and I'm sure, I'm sure needless to say, you had to have had so many lessons that you learned from the startup that you were oh, involved yeah. with before. Yeah. 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 And I, I want to get into those, but what I'm, you know, I'm really curious about, and I know my audiences too, is, is the crowdfunding. So like, Really, the big questions for me are at what point did you start that process? Because mm. some people are like, do I do this when I already have something created? Do I do mm-hmm. it at like which stage is is the best stage or is there a best stage? That's a good question. I, I think that there are, it just depends on what your goal is, I suppose. So let's say that your goal is to launch a product and bring it entirely to market completely free and clear of any outside funding, then you need to figure out how much that's going to cost and, and you know, how many, how many hundreds of thousands of dollars you're going to need if it's that high. And, you know, you're going to need to be upfront and honest with your audience that maybe you've done the research and you've done the design and testing, but you know, it's going to be six months or more until delivery and people will back products like that. You know, if they, if they trust you and they believe you and, and you've, you know, done your good, a good brand preparation and you, you built a good brand around your idea. It's certainly possible to do that. Uh, but if you're just trying to get market validation or traction for an idea in order to raise outside funding or in order to convince somebody to fund you know, the rest of your production or just get a small, a small initial order in to test market reception, that's also a great goal. And so uh, you know, I, I think the timing to do a crowdfunding campaign, to be honest, is well before you have a product. I don't think that you should ever produce anything before you sell it. That's one of my core my core values is like create a business plan before you come up with a product and then create uh, and then sell that product before you actually make it. By doing those two things, you will save yourself potentially years of heartache and hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars in wasted spend. And to, you know, illustrate that, what I mean is like, I've seen so many people in Denver and in other places, they have this great idea, they a great problem they're solving, they build the solution for it. They spend maybe 50 or $60,000 on a patent, maybe some initial inventory on testing, on tooling, on 3D printing, whatever it is. And then, you know, they put it on the crowdfunding campaign and it goes completely belly up because either one of three things, the, you know, they didn't prepare. Number two is that they didn't have any budget left over whatsoever to actually spend on the crowdfunding campaign to be successful. Or three, the market has rejected the idea and they would have probably really enjoyed to know that (laughs) <laughs> a lot sooner. And it's frustrating to, to see people com- kind of commit these same mistakes over and over again. But, it, but you know, the things that I learned from my last company before this were the importance of, you know, having really strong margins, the importance of validating, you know, your market reception and your market validity before producing new products, the importance in channel strategy. You know, that's another thing that we can go over in terms of like how channel strategy affects everything from your pricing to your product features, to your packaging. 
But in terms of like the crowdfunding, why I decided to do it to circle back to your original question is because I knew, even though I had a good investor network, that nobody was going to give me money for a betting company based off of a pun. And so I knew that I had to validate this via crowdfunding. And so our initial goal was $100,000. I think publicly facing, which is a different strategy, our goal was $50,000. And we ended up doing two eighty four. dollars And I attribute that entirely to our preparation. Yeah. How many, how many months did it take you to prepare before you launched it? Uh, as a general rule, we did 10 weeks. As a, general, okay. as a general rule, 8 to 12 weeks is a good preparation time. Yeah, that's what I've heard. I think a lot of people, I think you really nailed it. And that's why I think this episode is so important. Some people just think I'm going to put some, some cool, you know, yeah, yeah. put some copy together, get my, my listing up there. <laughs> Meanwhile, they've done no preparation. Nobody, you know, they haven't really seeded the, hey, <laughs> guess what's going to be happening? And I need you guys to support me. And then there's no market validation, which is so huge. And I agree with you. I've seen that happen so many times. You know, sometimes we think, just because our idea is good and it's something we want doesn't mean that a whole market is going to want it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so really and if, that. Yeah. And if I and if I can dive into the preparation for a second and yes, and, please. Because when you say when you say preparation, people are very confused about like, well, what do I have to do? Do I need to like make a video? Do I need to like shoot photos? The answer is you have to do all of it. And and specifically you have to build an initial audience. And that is going to come entirely from the email list that you build. And so I think where a lot of people make an um crucial first mistake in crowdfunding is they think that their friends or family are going to kind of like float the entire boat for them. Right. And they're going to get, you know, an initial 50 people that I know and love and they're all going to buy it. And then that'll get me on the homepage of Kickstarter. And then like, you know, it'll go viral. And like these people, people like imagine wild dreams at this stage because they're full of optimism and I, and I love them for it. Like I, I love anybody that enters into this stage with a ton of optimism, but the reality is you have to look at the numbers from like a very hard and fast perspective. So let's say that your goal is $100,000, is $100, right? Then you need to work backwards from there on how you're going to achieve it. The, the way that crowdfunding math works is that you need 30% of your total goal on that first day, preferably, you know, at, at preferably first 24 hours, could be first 48 or first 72. But you're going to need 30% of your overall goal on that first day. So if you want to do $100,000, you need $30,000 on day one. Interesting. It, yep. Yeah. It's just the way the crowdfunding math works, right? Then you get that big boost of initial sales. You'll be then you'll get on the homepage. You'll rise to the top of your category. You'll get newsletters. Kickstarter, Indiegogo will send newsletters out about you. It's just the way their algorithms work. So then to work backwards from there, okay, you need thirty thousand dollars on day one. And let's say that your average item is seventy dollars. Then you think the average person is going to buy one and a half items. Then that means that you have a hundred dollar average order value. And if you have a $100 average order value and you need $30,000 on day one, that means you need 300 paying customers on day one. People would take out their credit card and swipe it for you on day one. And if you need 300 customers on day one, and let's say, let's say you know a bunch of people, you're only going to get like maybe like a few, a few dozen people out of your network to like buy on day one, right? Like if, you, if you're a very extroverted person and have a very strong network. Like people right. just, people just will, they'll forget, they get busy. Like they, you know, your mom maybe like does something else that day, like, and that'll break your heart. But like, you need to focus on getting those customers from an email list, not from your immediate network. And I think that that's one of the biggest mistakes that people, people go through is they don't build that email list and they don't build that hype ahead of launch. And so an email list reasonably converts at around 3%, 2% if you're doing something wrong, 4% if you're doing something right. And so if you need 300 customers on day one, and it's a 3% conversion rate on your email list, give or take, then that means that you need 10,000 engaged emails before you launch, period, end of story. And that's exactly what we did. We put our heads down in February. We shot our content, our photo shoots, our video shoots. We wrote a bunch of copy, did some landing pages, ran some Facebook ads to email capture on those landing pages. We used a software called Kickoff Labs, which I'll recommend is good software. We hooked into our Shopify and our Google Analytics. And we ended up capturing 11,000 emails in eight weeks ahead of our crowdfund. I attribute that almost entirely to the brand voice that we created. And we ended up making $45,000 on our first day. So our email list converted at about 4% instead of three. Amazing. Amazing. Yep. So that's exactly, you just got to, it's just a linear, a linear process. It's just so smart, especially when done right for launching, for launching a new product. Right. And, then, and if you, yeah, and, and we did it in May. And if you tell people, hey, we're going to deliver in, in August, we ended up delivering, we ended up shipping October 1st. So we were 31 days late with our August window, which I'm still, yeah. pretty, I'm, I'm still pretty damn proud of because I think that 
that delivering on on a crowdfund is like extremely difficult. Yeah. But you know, you, if people are in, they're in. And I think that crowdfunding is actually a very beautiful thing because it kind of allows people this rare opportunity to read about a company and a person and a team and make a decision that normally only investors or bankers get to make when it comes to should this company exist, do I want to fund them? And I think it's a really lovely thing that that people can come together and bring companies to life. I, I have a very personal relationship with 3,000 people who brought our company to life and I will do anything for my for my Indiegogo backers. Like they many of them still email me or you know they they hear about us in press or something and they'll they'll shoot me a note. And it's just, you know, it's a very personal relationship and, and I, I can't thank them enough for bringing my dream true. Well, you know, people love to be a part of a story and that's the, that's, you know, you've really succeeded at branding when people want to be a part of that brand and be part of the rise and the, it, it's awesome, you know? So, and that's what crowdfunding allows you to do. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. And you know, it's, and if you tell them that you're going to deliver six months from now and they, and they make that purchase, they're, they're in, they've set that expectation. <laughs> like, yeah. That's, yeah. Know, and, and, and the thing is, is yeah. even if things, you know, change, you're keeping in touch with them. I mean, people are so forgiving, you know what I mean? Yeah, because as, they're, as long as and they know it's as long as you're transparent and you're, and you're mm-hmm. open and honest with them. Yes, they, they are. Let's get this out of the way. If you've been listening to me for the past month, you know that I've been talking a lot about my mentor and friend, Amy Porterfield and how she is the queen of digital courses. If it weren't for Amy, I'd be slinging just another online course because a good digital course, yeah, there's anything but set it and forget it about it. That's why I'm so excited to let you know that for the first time in a whole year, doors to Amy's Digital Course Academy have officially opened today. And I've got a bonus package for you that will help you speed up your way to course creation success. But you have to go to my personal link at thedrawshop.com forward slash Amy to get your hands on it. The doors will not be open long. So go check out what's on the inside. Just go to thedrawshop.com forward slash Amy. If you're down to chip away at that list with daily baby steps, make sure you hop inside Digital Course Academy alongside my bonus. Wait, Summer, what's the bonus? Well, did you hear my intro today where I talked about how my team and I at The Draw Shop now offer a service to help you perfect your elevator pitch so that people immediately understand what you do and how you can make their life better? It's the single statement that compels your prospects to take action right away. Well, your bonus when you join Amy Porterfield's Digital Course Academy is the elevator pitch. That's right. When you join, I'm going to give you this service for free, meaning you'll get to meet with one of our expert copywriters to define the problem you solve, how you solve it, and the transformation your customers experience after working with you. And then from there, we'll turn that into a short and sweet elevator pitch and create a compelling one-page visual story to help the world better understand your business and how you can help them. You can take this exact statement and infographic and use it for your course. I seriously can't wait for this program to change the game for you. Just head over to thedrawshop.com forward slash Amy. And when you join, we will get notice and send you all the details to get your bonus. Okay, back to the show. Okay, so you then have this success with the campaign. Yep. Let's talk about venture capital now. And what happened after that? Did you then raise (laughs) more money or... I'm, I'm such I'm such a jerk to my investors. I love my investors to death. I, I, just, I always I, I always throw them throw them under the bus and 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 this portion of the conversation. <laughs> uh, I you know I I love investors and venture capitalists as people. There's many of them that I know that are my good friends and that have invested in my company and and I and I you know they're great and they love their founders and they love their CEOs and they bring them to life. Venture capital math is an entirely different story. And so when people think about venture capital, they, they often think about the glory of the headlines they see where it's like, you know, company raises, you know, $50 million, like, you know, rumored to be a $300 million valuation or $250 million valuation. They, you know, they hear about, you know, Casper raising, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, at a billion dollar plus valuation. And the, and the reality is that there's a really cruel cold calculating equation behind a lot of these fundraises, which is if you raise, you know, $5 million or even let's say you raise $1 million on 
uh, which is hard, hard enough on a, you know, a $5 million valuation. You're basically committing to, depending on the way the math works for the fund that you raise at, you're basically committing to selling your company or exiting at at least a, I mean, the average fund, maybe a 30x multiple for, for an investor, depending on what their fund needs. I mean, some investors will tell you, we only need a 5x multiple. Others will tell you, we only need 10x or 20x. I've gotten some investors that told me they needed me to commit to giving them a 60x multiple on our, on our valuation. So AK, you want to raise at a you know, $5 million valuation, you need to commit to exiting for at least $300 million. And the truth is probably more than that because there's going to be future fundraising rounds and future dilution on the equity that they own yeah. in the company. And yeah. so you, know, you have to be very realistic about your company and what you're building. And for me, I was a first-time founder and CEO. And so even though you know, my, my eyes are way bigger than my stomach and my ambition is always going to kind of take me to the, to the maximum outcome, I have to be realistic about myself and say like, do I think that Sheets and Giggles can be a you know billion dollar company for some of these people that were asking for these huge multiples? If we end up getting to the stage where we're worth hundreds of millions of dollars, like I will, I, the the words I don't have any words to describe how grateful I'd be, right? But it's not something that I'm actively planning, forecasting, or predicting. And so, which is a very weird thing for founders because mostly founders go into the room and they have their five year forecast. And, you know, somehow they go from year one at $300,000 in revenue to year five at $87 million in revenue with a totally straight face. I think it's really funny when people do that. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think that my pitch to VCs has been very different than a lot of my peers, which is like I walk in and I basically say, hey, look, here's, Here's the revenue we're currently doing. Here's a valuation that I think is fair based off of that. The long-term goal for the company is to either exit for you know X million dollars, or to you know potentially you know raise Y million dollars, or to you know just end up you know paying out dividends long-term or whatever it is. And I'm like, but the num- but the number one thing you should be hearing in all that is optionality. I really want optionality because I haven't defined yet what success looks like for this company. And if you're comfortable with that optionality and you know really good upside with very low 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 side, then you know I think that you should invest in this company. But I almost pitch S and G as like a double or a triple versus like a home run or a strikeout. And I and I think that you know for some investors they basically back that immediately and been like, nope, sorry, that's not what we need to make the math work on our fund. And then for other investors, they've really enjoyed that you know type of vision and and I have people that I'm totally aligned with who have invested in the company. And so I would just say in terms of a, a high level, sorry, it was a long talk about VCs. I have a lot of thoughts about VCs. No, um, I and I, I love it. And, yeah, you're, and, and I, you're offering a different perspective on it, which thanks. I super appreciate. Well so we ra- yeah and so we've raised two point two million total, I believe, at this stage in the game. We've done Techstars, which is a great, great program a great accelerator if people are looking for a place to like get their business off the ground because they have like an idea, but they don't really know where to go with it from maybe a prototype. And that's um, tech stars. A business. I, tech stars. Yeah. Okay. And it's an accelerator similar to like a Y Combinator or, um, you know, 500 startups or something like that. Right. But tech stars is my favorite out of all the accelerators. I've done them twice actually once as an employee and once as a CEO, they've changed my life. And so I owe them a lot. And so you know, I, I have a very high opinion of, of some investors. I think that the VC game in general is very dangerous for founders because I think as a, as a society, we train people to raise money and not to make money. And I think that, you know, if you raise a million dollars, like your friends will throw you a party and like, you know, your Facebook wall explodes and, you know, you're you toast of the town. But if you make a million dollars, like nobody cares. Uh, it's that is, and I'm so glad you said it. I'm so- so on board with you. I'm so glad you said yeah, that. It's, it's so, so, so true. Like, yeah. And, and that's how we train, you know, young people in their, in their early and mid twenties to raise money instead of make money. And, and, you know, God bless the investors that, that, you know, that I, that make this possible for the startup ecosystem, but they love it. They love that type of mentality because from day one, people are thinking about raising instead of making. And so yeah. I wanted, I wanted to do the opposite. And I knew that if I made enough money and my metrics were good enough, and we had the right type of numbers to show people that even though I had this weird little company based off a pun, that people would basically have to invest because the numbers were so compelling. 
And so that's, that's basically what I did from day one. And it's been a very painless fundraising process for us so far, knock on wood. And uh, we've got some great people that have invested in the company. And, you know, I, I'm, I can talk about anything more in specifics in terms of like how to, how to pitch or, you know, think questions to ask VCs or, you know, ways to make sure you're aligned. But, you know, bottom line is you've got to understand what the goals of the fund are and to make sure that you are completely aligned in terms of your company's goals with theirs. Because when you sign with someone, you're, you're committing to a long-term relationship with that investor. You can't set expectations poorly in the beginning. No, totally true. I think that's a whole episode in itself, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, don't, and don't give up board seats if you can avoid it. I, I, that's, not, that's the best thing that we've ever done is, is I, you know, I've, I've been able to maintain really good directional control of the company. And yes, you know, partially because the investors trust me, but also because I'm, I'm very unwilling to part with that control. And so if you, you know, the more, and that's another way, reason why you should focus on, you know, revenue and profitability instead of raising money is if you're, if you're revenue positive, and you are having profitable months, and you control your own destiny. You get to work with the people that you want to work with. I agree. And, and you get to you get the terms that you that are going to be best for your life and, and your team, your company. And and you know I, I've turned down two different deals at very early stages. One was the day before the crowd fund. I turned down on April thirtieth, twenty eighteen, before we had ever sold a single unit. I turned down a four hundred thousand dollar investment offer in the company at a fairly reasonable valuation. Because it was basically, I want a board seat and you have to accept tonight if you want this money. And I knew what they were trying to do. They were trying to get me to agree to bad terms before I had ever seen the traction that my company was going to get. And, yeah. I had, and I had to write them back an email saying like, look, I'd, I'd be happy to re-engage on this next week, but I need to focus on the most important day of my life tomorrow. I ended up turning down nearly half a million dollars for a company that was just an idea at that stage, which is a really, really, really hard thing to do. But, but I bet you look back now and you're glad you did that. I am. And I only was able to do it because I looked at the metrics that we had in terms of email capture and engagement. We were capturing emails at like a 45% clip, which is nuts wow. for, for email capture. And so I just knew you know, we had our open rates and our emails, you know, sitting at 40, 50% open rates for our email list. Like I just, I knew that this was going to be a good crowd fund like ahead of time. And you can kind of just extrapolate that out if you, if you know your numbers really well. Does, was this something that, you learned before in, in the startup that you were working with? Or is this something that you just started to learn along the way during the Sheets and Giggles journey? Kind of along the way, to be honest. At my last company, I was in charge of mostly our retail channels. And so I did all of our deals with um, the retailers I mentioned earlier. I did all of our Amazon channel marketing. I actually, ironically, I wasn't allowed to touch the copy <laughs> at my last company. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> I know, I know. I love writing. I love, I love copywriting. It was something to where like, they just didn't, they just had somebody else to do that. And so I, you know, I was focused on channel partnerships. It was something, I think I, I learned a lot of like lessons along the way there. I did learn, we did do a crowd fund at the prior company. So that was a really good learning experience. I didn't, I didn't run that, but I was a big part of it. And so like, I got the kind of experience firsthand, like mistakes that were made. I kept the journal on it. That journal was really helpful for me when I was doing my own, my own crowd fund a year later. And then in terms of the VC stuff, I had to learn all that on the fly. And luckily, I have very good mentors from the Techstars network that you know were always available for a phone call for me to ask really stupid questions. That's that's awesome. Yeah, you need you need mentors that you can ask really stupid questions too. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Let's talk marketing. Sure. So beyond crowdfunding, which was its own, you know, marketing itself, but beyond that, and you had talked about different channels, I'd love to hear your ongoing strategy with your marketing and further getting it out there. And like, what, what does that look like for you? I'm sure there's a number of different things that you do. Yeah, number. So uh, right now, our, we have two core sales channels that we sell on. We, we sell on sheetsgiggles.com, shameless plug, go, go buy the best bed sheets you'll ever use. And then we also sell on Amazon. And we do about, you know, it gravitates between 30, 70 and 40, 60 in terms of the sales that we do on Amazon versus our site. We basically will spend most of our advertising money on a mix of channels. Facebook's very important. Instagram is important. Google is obviously very important. And then also Amazon. We spend a lot on Amazon marketing as well. But generally speaking, we try to keep everything profitable. You know, I'm very, very concerned about unit economics. That's my number one focus of the company is to understand our break even 
points and make sure that we're hitting them every month. And then that way we can say that we're growing. You know, I think May this year was 3x May of last year. And it was, and we did it profit, profitably. And that's crazy important to me. Like every, every month in 2020 has been bigger than the corresponding quarter in 2019. And Congratulations. That's, that's thank awesome. you. Thank, thank you. I'm really, I'm really excited about that. And I think that the, you know, in terms of the market, going back to the marketing channels, like I've named some really core ones that I think everybody's aware of. We also do a lot of radio advertising on Colorado public radio. I love CPR and I love supporting that. And I love, you know, the recognition that it gives us within the state. I think that strategically, I really enjoy building the brand and the brand affinity and, and recognition and word of mouth within like locales. I'm from South Florida. That's one of our hubs. It's where we warehouse as well. So we have a lot of people that know us down there. I have a really good group of friends and network in Seattle. So we have a really good hub out there. Colorado is obviously our home base. We have team members in Florida and Los Angeles. And then, you know, so basically we're, we're kind of cultivating this like very deep following in Colorado, which has been really great. You know, to that end, it's a very genuine relationship that we have with, with the people of Colorado. We just donated you know, forty thousand dollars to COVID nineteen relief in the state. Which, if you oh, told wow. me, yeah, if you told me two years ago, you know, when I was doing my little crowdfund, that you know, two years later we'd be donating, you know, meaningful dollars to you know the greatest cri- crisis of my lifetime, I would have just burst with joy. And so, you know, we 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 plant a tree for every single order, and that gets us good word of mouth as well. Planted tens of thousands of trees so far mostly in Colorado and in California and in Florida. Um, so I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to right now, <laughs> my, my husband and I are, we're in the middle of remodeling a house that we just bought right before COVID actually. Okay. <laughs> so we're in the middle of this remodel and I'm like, Oh, we got to get new sheets and all this kind of stuff. So obviously I'm going to go like right after we're done, I'm going to go buy some sheets. I'm super excited. Great. Uh, am I, am I in for a treat? Are they going to be super comfortable? I'm they're excited. the best, they're the best you'll ever do. So, so, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, I say I'm not just talking cheat. So basically uh, they have a lower coefficient of friction than cotton. And so they're smoother and softer. And so we're also able to have a 400 thread count while be, so being super breathable while feeling like a higher thread count cotton. And then they also manage moisture incredibly well. So if you sweat, at night, they actually will wick the moisture away, spread it evenly across the fabric, almost every single filament, and then evaporate that moisture before you ever even notice it's there. So it's really, really tremendous for hot sleepers. And because they don't hold any moisture, bacteria and dust mites can't grow in that environment, at least not as rapidly as other materials. In fact, if you introduce a population of dust mites into our sheets, half of them will die within like 42 days. Wow. Um, yeah. And so it's a, it's a really cool product in and of itself. And I'm very proud of it. Yeah. You'll love it. You'll adore it. I, I get in the bed every night and I swear, I'm like, I can't believe this is, this is my company. And we, you know, on Amazon, we've got I think 564 reviews as of this morning. I'm freaked about our reviews. We've got over 2,500 reviews on our website now, 4.8 stars on our website, 4.5 stars on Amazon, I think 4.7 on Facebook. A couple hundred reviews. So we, you know, I'm really, really, I'm a freak about the customer experience. That's everything to me. What is the most important lesson you've learned throughout this whole process? Oh gosh, the whole process. Um, I know I got you. Yeah, yeah, that's a tough one. Recently, you know, you asked what we've been doing on the marketing side, and I listened to some of our advertising things. Word of mouth is huge for us as well. But I think the number one thing that I've done and I've learned is how to be a CEO. And, and what I mean by that is like, you know, when you start a company and you're the only person, you are mm-hmm. the, found, you're the founder and CEO, but you're yep. also the head of marketing. You are the supply chain manager. You are the customer service rep. You are the, you know, like the copywriter or the graphic designer or the social media manager. And all the hats. Right. All the hats. And, and, it's, and you develop these skills and not only the skills, but also the desire and the passion for each part of the job, each job that your business does. And you develop this like very innate attachment to each role that makes a company tick. And so as the company has grown and you know, you hire people and you hire a finance team and you hire a marketing team and you hire a product and ops and customer service and, you know, warehousing and, you know, you, you end up putting all these pieces together and stacking them together. 
And then all of a sudden you look up and two years later, you've got, you know, people asking you to not micromanage (laughs) and you have have people asking you to trust them and to give them more power, more responsibility. And honestly, I was very uncomfortable with it for a long time because partially because you have people in your ear and investors in your ear that are, that say, you know, Hey, the magic of this is you, like you're, you know, you're what makes this tick. Like you're, you know, and it, and it kind of eats at you. You get that poison where you're almost believing your own press. And so I think that in the last three or four months, I've really, really done a, a conscious effort to take my hand off the wheel, especially on the marketing side. And basically, because I, I had already passed off product and operations, I already passed off customer service and just overseen that. And marketing, it was really the last piece that I, I, held, I held a really, really tight grip on. And I hired somebody really, really stellar for my head of marketing. And after about six months, you know, she started telling me like, look, you know, I, I, here's why I joined the company. Here's what I need out of you. Here's what I need out of S&G. And, you know, I, I feel like you're, you're kind of turning me into like a glorified media buyer. And, and that's not really what I, what I wanted to do. And it was hard feedback and I thought about it and I just realized that I was so afraid of like losing that, that control for whatever reason that I wasn't allowing her to do what I knew that she was capable of. And so now she's been running our, our marketing almost entirely with, you know, a total control over the rest of our team for about three months. And they've been three of the best months in, in company history. And so, I'm, wow. yeah, so I think that just learning to that you can't do it all, you know, you can do, you can do one thing well, or a bunch of things half-assed and keeping that in mind and making sure that I'm, you know, managing my team, setting goals for my team, unlocking my team's work and giving them the tools they need and the funds they need to achieve their goals, but not actively handholding and trusting them to, to do a good job because I hired, I hired good people. Well, and that empowers them. And when people feel empowered, they do better work. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we've actually, you know, I feel very blessed because we made the decision as a team to stay fully remote for forever. And so awesome. we, I'll miss people for sure. I mean, we're going to, we're going to do team meetings once a month and once a quarter and maybe some coffee shop days here and there, but you know, for the most part now we're going to be full remote. And so I've actually kind of weirdly been thinking about this a lot personally lately where it's like I've decoupled geography from my work. And as someone who's moved to Connecticut, Seattle, Denver, and Boulder for work in my in my twenties. I'm kind of feeling like a dog that caught a car, and so <laughs> I, don't really, I don't don't really know uh, what to do next. So if anybody any listeners have any ideas, I'm I'm all ears. I love it. Yeah. I love it. So many so many good things here. Your story is just phenomenal. I'm I'm super impressed. I think you just offered so much value for people that are, you know, at that stage or even people that are at that idea stage or people that have businesses and are launching something new within their business. Appreciate that. I hope I hope so. And I didn't even get into <laughs> my background super weird for anybody listening that's you know, been fired or, or, you know, feeling down or whatever. I know a lot, I think a a full quarter of the American workforce has been laid off in the the last two months, three months. I've been fired four times (laughs) in my career. I'm a, I am a horrendous employee. Uh, And so, and so, you know, typical of an entrepreneur though. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. So don't, you know, I, I think that that's something, you know, just, I'm, I'm actually writing a piece on imposter syndrome and that sort of thing. And like, you know, I, I couldn't hold down a steady job for a long time. And, you know, eventually I just decided that I didn't want to be beholden to anybody else. So, you know, it's definitely something to where I appreciate what you said and it makes me feel really good and, and, you know, oddly validated when I get feedback like that. So I appreciate it. Well, there's reasons all those things have happened, you know, and it, they do, they, they really suck in the moment. They suck. Oh yeah. God. But it's, it's what you do with that, which you clearly have done. And, the other news is, is that sucky moments are still to come for everyone. That's just how life is. Yeah. <laughs> it's what you do with those sucky moments. As great as things are, things happen in all areas of our life, you know, that are inevitable, but mm-hmm. it's what, it's what we do with those that, that matter. Absolutely. Yeah. I, and I think that I'm, I'm hopeful that a lot of goods going to come out of this period of, of American history and, you know, half the days I'm, I'm like, it, I guess it's good that we live in interesting times. And then the other half of days I'm like, screw whoever said that. 
Right. Uh, right. You know, <laughs> but, <laughs> totally. But, yes. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. think we're all living that right now, right? <laughs> yeah. But I, I'll tell you what, it's good. I, I feel very lucky, very privileged to be able to say that I, you know, I'm, I'm in control of my own destiny and it's uh, it's definitely a real blessing. So I, I, I hope for others listening out there that are thinking about starting their own business, you know, do worst case, best case scenario and, and hopefully realize that the worst case is not so bad and the best case is, is pretty damn awesome. Absolutely. Definitely. Love that. So let's, let's tell our listeners where they can find more information about you. you. You mentioned a few things that you're writing. Where can they find that? And also your website. It's just, it's sheetsgiggles.com, correct? Yep. Yeah. No and in the URL. So just okay. like, yeah. So sheetsgiggles.com. We're at sheetsgiggles everywhere on social media. And so just like the brand name, but no ampersand. And I'm pretty easy guy to find. I mean, LinkedIn, Colin McIntosh, I think. I think my official title on LinkedIn is like Bedsheets Ninja. I don't know. I, just, <laughs> I, got, I got so frustrated with all the, you know, marketing ninja and like, you know, PR ninja. I was like, you know what? I'm going to make fun of these people. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, and then, you know, on, on my blog, I just started a new blog. It's, it's fairly bare bones right now, but hopefully by the time people hear this, there'll be three or four things written on it that I've mentioned. It's colinblogs.com. Super simple. Can't believe that URL was available. You'd be shocked at what URLs are available. I know um, it is weird. I I found that recently. Yeah. I was looking up some stuff. I'm like, how is that available? I guess people <laughs> let stuff go. <laughs> got, I've got one. That I'm, I swear to, unless I, this is probably a bad segue to end the interview, but I I've got a a weird one called giraffecaraf.com, and I swear to God, I'm going to make a line of carafes that look like giraffes, <laughs> and I'm gonna, just just because of the brand name. But yeah, so in any case, this is great. I appreciate you. If anybody needs advice out there, please, for the love of God, don't email me. But you can find me, you can find me elsewhere and, and I'd be happy to lend some advice if anybody needs anything. Awesome. Thank you so much, Colin. This has been so much fun. Awesome. Thanks, Summer. I had a great time. Thank you. Hey guys, I just want to say thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you haven't already done so, would you do me a favor and go subscribe and review this podcast? My goal is to continue to deliver you content that will really move the revenue needle in your business and give you up-to-date content on anything else that can dramatically help your business. You can also find us at thedrawshop.com slash podcast where you can comment on the podcast or contact us directly with any issues you'd like me to address. Thanks again. I really, really appreciate you listening and I'll see you next time.